So how many of you know the story of Kane's Arcade? Okay. So Nirvan Mullick is the guy who made that film that you watched about it. Uh, he's an L.A. resident as well, an Angelino. I don't think I've fully, like, lived here enough to feel like I could call myself an Angelino yet. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us about that little story and where we go from there, right? Yeah. All right, Nirvan. Hi. Thanks. So Shane asked me to share the story. Um, Kane's Arcade is an 11-minute documentary that I posted online about a year and a half ago. And since then, it has grown from a movie into this movement to foster creativity in kids around the world, all unintentionally. And Shane asked me to kind of share how that fits into collapse of an education system that's not fostering creativity in kids. So my background's in filmmaking, experimental animation. I want to share a little bit of my own story, kind of the context in which the film I made found itself, and then how that film came to be and, and what's happened since then. So. Um, in terms of context, there's this sense that there's a creativity crisis in schools. Um, Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk, it's the most popular talk on TED, talks about how schools are killing creativity. They were sort of set up in an industrial society to kind of make kids uniform. And IBM did a study of 1,500 executives, and, and the thing that they want the most is creativity. But it's not really being fostered in, in kids. Some kids are getting through, but a lot of them are being missed. Uh, there was a, a psych psychologist named Torrance who started studying creativity back in the 50s and doing a creativity test, finding that you can actually measure creativity. He would do things that would measure divergent and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking, coming up with lots of ideas, and then convergent thinking, focusing those ideas to create something of value, which is what creativity is. And he gave this test to millions of kids. Um, they give a kid like a fire truck and say, like a toy fire truck, and say, come up with ideas on how to make this truck better. And then measure how many unique, cool ideas these kids would come up with. And this was done in the 50s. They've been tracking those kids since then over time, and they found that kids who did perform well on this uh, are three times more likely to succeed, more patents, more inventions, more success, more even happiness. And they took a new look at the study recently and found that, so there's something CQ, creativity quotient, and IQ. Uh, you know, and IQ and CQ were both going up um, over time. And then in the 90s, something happened where CQ has been going down. And nobody's quite sure why just yet, whether it's increase in video games, some people believe, some people disagree strongly, whether it's um, no child left behind and, and this reliance on standardized testing where teachers really aren't given a chance to teach the kids passions and they have to teach this test. And um, So there's a lot of debate still out, but there is this sense that the CQ has been declining. So this is the context in which I found myself. I, I went to public school in Florida and I, was, I consider myself a lucky kid. I was bored out of my mind in grade school. I, I was actually paddled and spanked for playing with my food and making flip books and animation in my books. Um, and then in third grade, I got pulled out of class and given this weird creativity test. Uh, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I thought it was a lot better than the other test I was being given. And I did well enough, and then I got labeled as this gifted child. And one day a week, I would get pulled out of my boring as hell class and put into this really fun class where we were taught brain riddles and did fun stuff. And I was actually introduced to something called Future Problem Solving, which is a program that was actually invented by Torrance, Weird Connection. Uh, and through that, I learned a lot about creative problem solving, creative thinking, and a lot of the tools I use today as a filmmaker and a consultant, I trace back to that. And I think that really saved me. So. I became a filmmaker, I came out here, I went to CalArts, studied experimental animation, did some obscure films, started some obscure nonprofits. I don't know if anybody here has heard of the One Second Film Project, but this is a, a film I started 15 years ago. Um, anyway, so I, my story with Kane and Kane's Arcade begins about two years ago when I went to buy a door handle for my car. I had a 96 Corolla, 
uh, a legacy of being an independent filmmaker trying to make nonprofit films. And it had this broken door handle. And I live downtown, and there's this industrial part of downtown, just over the LA River in East LA, Boyle Heights, and you can get used glass, used auto parts. And I pulled into this random auto parts store called Smart Parts Aftermarket. And when I pulled in, I met this nine-year-old boy named Kane who'd taken over, this was his dad's auto parts store, and he had taken over the whole front of the store with this really elaborate arcade that he'd made entirely out of cardboard in his imagination. And he'd spent all summer building it. And I was instantly curious, I asked him how it worked, and he told me, I mean, this, so it's an auto parts store, but then there's this whole front part of this store that's been taken over by this, these cardboard games. And he had like three or four games. There was a cardboard basketball game with this little basketball hoop. There's a little soccer game with army goalies and you could flick a paper ball, a little skee ball game that he'd made. And he had a whole wall of prizes and displays that he'd made with toy cars, his own personal objects. So I asked him how it worked. He said for one dollar you get four turns or for two dollars you could get a fun pass and get 500 turns for, for two dollars. <laughs> so I bought the fun pass, obviously, um, and I ended up playing his games, and they were really fun. Like, they were really simple materials. Um, after I bought the fun pass, he had iPod headphones, those white ones, and he made a little office. So he stamped my hand with a little stamp, and then he leans into these uh, headphones that are plugged into a cardboard box, and he said, fun pass, two dollars. <laughs> and that's when I was, like, looking around, like, wondering what's, what's going on. <laughs> And then he said, wait a second, you're, you know, uh, this is my, my grand opening. He ran around back, and he comes back with this paper, paper, uh, crushed up paper ball, which was the soccer ball and the basketball hoop. And when I'd score a point, like I'd be playing basketball, and, and I, when I'd score a point, he would crawl into the box and push out prize tickets from inside the box. And they'd come out. And that, that was this moment in my life where, like, um, that movie Ratatouille, where the the, there's a chef and, and, or a food critic and he eats a bite of the soup and he gets sucked back to his childhood and he has this memory and, and kind of this tear in his eye that was me in the middle of this auto parts store on this random Sunday afternoon I was a kid again I was reminded of my own creativity my own imagination why I started making films and it's rare that you feel that feeling of inspiration and, and I decided I wanted to make a film about this and, and so I went back I was telling all my friends about Kane's Arcade and I, and I went back because I still had some turns in my fun pass to try to play. And uh, Kane wasn't there. I met him on the last day of summer. So he actually was going back to school. I met his dad. And his dad recognized me from the security camera footage because he'd been in the back and he saw me. And I told him I wanted to make a short film about his son's arcade. And I asked if that would be cool. And he said, that, you know, Kane would love that, but you should know it's kind of a little joke around here because you've been Kane's first and only customer. Yeah, I had that same feeling. I was like, oh, my heart was broken. Uh, he told me that Kane had been there all summer working on this arcade, building it, perfecting it, and he would be asking all of his dad's customers to play, and everybody just walked by and got their auto part and left, and Kane never gave up. So Kane was super ready for customers, right? Like, not only did he have this elaborate arcade and prizes and his own toys, he had his own T-shirt. It said Kane's Arcade on the back, and on the front it said Staff. <laughs> I mean, this is a lemonade stand gone to the extreme. And his dad told me that Kane wouldn't wear his shirt to school, like he only wore it on the weekends when he came to work, because he told his friends at school that he had his own arcade, and his friends didn't believe him, and they would tease him about it. So I decided as part of the film, oh, he also had the security system, right? So on the back of the fun pass, <laughs> On all of his games, he had taped a calculator to all of the games. And I asked Kane, what are the calculators for? He said, it's for security. And on the back of the fun pass, he had written two numbers. I actually have my fun pass here. Um, so he had written two numbers, a big number and a small number. And he said, what you do is you turn the, the calculators on, and you put the big number in, and then you push the check mark button, and then the small number comes out. And I was like, the check mark button. <laughs> Like, he had created his own childhood encryption, just playing around with a calculator. And I was like, this kid is a genius. So, as part of the short film, I decided to organize a flash mob of surprise customers to make Kane's day. 
I posted this event on Facebook, just describing what I loved about his arcade and inviting people to come out and play. And it got shared around, it got passed to this uh, Facebook site called Hidden LA, which had about 230,000 fans. And an hour later, an NBC news truck was at Kane's <laughs> Arcade. And his dad called me, Kane's dad called me, he's like, NBC News is there, I'm like taking Kane down to the arcade. And I was like, no, no, don't go. He's like, why not? I was like, well, the surprise flash mob is tomorrow. If Kane's on the news today, he's going to know. It's going to ruin the surprise. He's like, oh, right. So he like, Kane's like, what's going on? What's about the news? And his dad made up this story about people were stealing cars down there. And, uh, the news was covering it and kind of covered it up. And, and Kane's like, oh, is, is my arcade OK? He's like, yeah, yeah. So it also hit the front page of Reddit, right, the, the, this Facebook event. And all of a sudden, it was going viral. Uh, there were tens of thousands of people rooting for Kane, and hundreds of people were going to come out the next day to play his games. So I started making this film on Kane. I, I recorded his everyday, normal day life. And he was getting used to a camera around. And then the next day, his dad took him to Shakey's Pizza, which is where he'd always go and play the arcade games there. And that's where he won that first basketball hoop that he started building his whole arcade with. And while he was at Shakey's Pizza, hundreds of people came and met up at Kane's Arcade. We made signs that said Kane's Arcade and posters. And when his dad brought him back, there were hundreds of people chanting, we came to play, you know, and holding up these signs for Kane, and, and we just filmed his smile. And if you haven't seen it, you can watch the film, but it's this really magical smile. And the film was all about just making this kid's day and how this internet came together and a group of strangers came together to make this kid's day. And kind of thought that would be the end of it. I, I told his dad that I wanted to try to raise a scholarship fund for Kane. And so at the end of the film, I made this little website, canesarcade.com, and invited people to chip into a scholarship fund. And I told his dad I was going to try to raise $25,000 for his son. And his dad was like, yeah, right, you know, good luck. <laughs> so I said, well, if we fall short, we fall short. But maybe in a year or so, we'll, we'll raise a, a couple grand and it'll help out. I posted the film on April 9th, 2012, about a year and a half ago. It was the day after my birthday. I spent my birthday editing the film. I was like, I need to finish this before Kane doesn't care about his arcade anymore. So that was my deadline. <laughs> Um, I, I posted the film, and the first day the film was posted, it got over a million views. It just went completely bananas. And we raised over $60,000 for a scholarship fund on day one. So we raised the goal to $100,000, and thinking, you know, by the time Kane's ready for college, that might cover a semester. <laughs> And the next day was $110,000. And people just kept donating. And then we were like, well, do we raise the goal again? And his dad's like, yes, please. You know? <laughs> How about a million dollars? But we didn't want to keep raising this goal without having a plan. Things were happening so fast. And people were investing in us reaching this goal. And without a plan, we didn't want to take advantage of that kind of online trust. Right? Now, people are coming together online to make not only his day, but his future. It's this really awesome thing. And this film, like, this was my first time really going through this viral, phenomenal experience. And you've got a website that's crashing, and you're raising, you know, 50, 60 grand a day. You're trying to keep that up. You're getting phone calls from the media, if you were stupid enough to put your phone number on the uh, internet. <laughs> I put my roommate's number on the internet, so he was really happy with me. <laughs> um, we had 10,000 emails. Uh, in five different kinds of inboxes, from your Vimeo inbox, your YouTube inbox, if you have messages turned on on Facebook, your different Gmail accounts. And there's really great emails in there. I mean, I missed an email from Jack White. I missed an email from Jay Leno. I mean, I got them three weeks later, but it was a little late to kind of take advantage of. I didn't sleep the first two days. And it wasn't just the money we were raising for Kane, but you know, hit, our Facebook page went up to 130,000 fans overnight, and parents were posting these pictures of their kids who'd seen the film and then went to the trash, took out some cardboard, and started making their own arcades and setting them up in their kitchen, you know, and making their own shirts. And they were like, how are we going to get customers into our kitchen, you know? And <laughs> there, this was all over the world, and kids were making these arcades in their garages and their schools. They were using them to raise money for children's cancer research, for their school art program. All these beautiful stories were coming in, and I was just trying to read the internet for those first two days. Yahoo put the video on their homepage, 
and they contacted us and said this was the most positively received story we've ever had on our homepage of all time. And they actually put it back on their homepage a few days later. So this really phenomenal, phenomenal response. Um, grown men were posting these response videos of the film, and it was just them crying. It was like the opposite of two girls, one cup. Like it was <laughs> much more uplifting. And I was just stoked that this was all happening. And after two days of not sleeping, I had, you know, I was it was kind of just this blind goal at the time to try to start this nonprofit that could take this viral moment and turn it into more of a movement that could foster creativity of other kids like Kane. Because while Kane's story and how this internet came together was unique, you know, the fact that there was this creative kid like Kane, there's kids like him in, in auto parts stores and everybody has, knows a kid like Kane in their community. So how could we foster their creativity? And I, I wrote a uh, mission on a napkin and the mission was to find, foster, and fund creativity and entrepreneurship in more kids like Kane. And then I tried to leverage all of the media attention to try to raise money for this nonprofit. So five days after the film came out, I reached out to the Goldhirsch Foundation, uh, Ben Goldhirsch. I've known him for 12 years. He was on the board of another nonprofit I started. There was a lot of trust there. He started Good Magazine. And he said, you are starting at the destination. There are so many organizations spending tens and hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get this kind of engagement and encourage project-based learning in kids, and you guys have stumbled on it. How can I help? I said, well, we need some resources. He said, let me know what you need, and the answer is yes. Five days after the film was posted, the Goldhurst Foundation gave us a $250,000 challenge grant that started matching donations to Kane's scholarship funds. So for every dollar given by the public to Kane's scholarship, the Goldhurst Foundation started giving us a dollar to start this nonprofit. And that's what became something we now call the Imagination Foundation. It didn't have a name, it didn't have any programs at the beginning, it just had this viral video and this authentic response from kids and parents and educators around the world. So I was able to have people help me answer emails and coordinate this response from educators all over. And within the first two months, we started a school pilot program. And over 200 schools in nine countries started building cardboard arcades and using the film to teach kids math, science, engineering, a lot of project-based learning, core values. Uh, and that went really well. And then we decided to develop that even further. Now, October 2nd was when we did the first flash mob for Kane. So th the film was posted in April. Six months later was the anniversary. And we decided to try to mark the day of play that we had for Kane with something we called the Global Cardboard Challenge. So we issued this Global Cardboard Challenge. I made a follow-up video called Kane's Arcade 2, which was posted three weeks before the anniversary of this day. And we just challenged people around the world, kids around the world, to build something awesome using cardboard, recycled materials, and their imagination. And then on the anniversary of the flash mob we did for Kane, we said we're going to have a global day of play where we have a flash mob for kids all around the world go out and celebrate the creativity of kids in your community. So within the three weeks of posting that second video, we had over 270 events in 40 countries organized. Over 11,000 kids took part the first year. It was really, really awesome. Um, and so we decided to do it again. We just had our second Global Cardboard Challenge and Day of Play. And this year, we had over 80,000 kids take part in 44 countries around the world. So it grew 700%. Uh, it's something about the story that sparks the imagination of kids combined with cardboard, this simple material that's just inspiring kids to unplug and play. So it's this really beautiful, scalable, project-based learning model. Uh, it's growing in capacity. We had over 40 libraries take part this year. Um, and Kane and I have gotten to go around the world and travel and share the story. So the impact on Kane, he was the youngest speaker. We went to France, and he's been the youngest speaker to speak at the Cannes Lions International Festival of Creativity where he shared the stage with Ariana Huffington and President Clinton. <laughs> he was the youngest entrepreneur to speak at the USC Marshall School of Business, and CNN actually sent a crew out to cover it to get Kane's lessons that he's learned. Um, he was flown up to Sacramento and given the California, the Latino Spirit Award by the California State Assembly. He went out to New York. He was the youngest speaker at TEDx Teen, hosted by Chelsea Clinton, and his face was literally on a billboard in Times Square. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, he was backstage just making games out of like the TED pamphlets, and he's always playing. 
Um, back in LA, he got his own billboard. Uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Villaraigosa, came out and Kane added him to his staff and made a special shirt that said mayor on it. And Kane was given a cardboard key to the city. <laughs> the Saturday after the video was posted, this was unannounced. You know, we didn't have a flash mob, but over a thousand people came out to play Kane's game. There was, it was like a fairy tale. There was a line around the block. It was like a four or five hour line that people were waiting to play these cardboard games. People traveled all around the world. Jack Black has come with his kids to play, and actually they sent us this home video of his kids at home making cardboard games after they'd been and visited. Um, so it was trending worldwide. Um, you know, Justin Timberlake was tweeting it out. It, was, it just got all this press and media around the world. And um, Kane, Kane has recently retired. He ran his arcade for about two years, and then he got tired of pushing the tickets out from inside the box. And his new dream is to start a, a bike shop. But um, the, the, the bottom line is this has changed Kane's life. I mean, uh, we, we, not only through the scholarship fund, but just when I met him, I asked him what he wanted to be, and he said he wanted to join the SWAT team. You know, and now when people ask him what he wants to be, he's like, a game designer, an engineer, or the SWAT team. But his, <laughs> his horizons have broadened. And his dad told me that when I first met Kane, his, he was behind in reading. And his teachers in school actually considered him slow, and they wanted to hold him back a year. And since this whole experience, not only has his grades improved, he's stopped stuttering. He's a shy kid. You know, it, it took him a while to open up even on camera. Now he's a public speaker. He gets paid to travel. He's got an agent at WME. Um, and his school considers him gifted. He's the gifted kid that he always was. But it's changed his approach and, and, and his own self-confidence. And so for me, there's like three big lessons. The first is that every child is gifted. And we need to foster the creativity of every child, giving them not only the skills to build the worlds they imagine, but to also imagine the world that they can build. These are the people who are going to be solving tomorrow's problems, today's problems, that we don't have the solutions for yet. The next big lesson for me was that any moment can be a movement, because I went to buy a door handle for my car. This is where this started for me. And, and just the, the fact that the smallest moments can often have the biggest impact, and it doesn't take much to change the life of a child. And then the third lesson, and what, what I would encourage all of you to always do, is to always buy the fun pass. This is an awesome deal. Thanks. Thank you. So that talk was actually um, a while in the making. Um, the I definitely tried to get them last time at Comp for Future. That sort of fit um, thematically, and also at if, if I'm remembering the dates right, at Disruption. But just like they were totally blowing up and all over the world. And Nirvana, are you still in earshot? Um, what was the um, the like history of computers, or no, the the museum of computers that uh, Kane got like the we close the place and let you run around and play with everything. Oh, the exploratorium. Yes, the exploratorium. Kid got run of the exploratorium. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're going to keep talking, do it into the mic. <laughs> Can you turn that one on, Ash? You're reminding me of... Okay. Let's um, talk about the Exploratorium. Well, the Exploratorium was awesome, but what I was going to share is this story from Robert Manning, uh, who is the lead engineer of NASA and JPL, who saw the story and pulled us aside and said, you know, when I was a kid, I used to make cardboard rockets when, in my backyard. And now I just went, like, built one that landed on Mars because he was the lead engineer on the Mars rover project. So he took Kane and I to JPL, and we got this special little tour. Uh, I included that story in the follow-up film, Kane's Arcade Part 2. And then uh, uh, about a month ago, we were in Colorado giving a talk to these like Fortune 500 executive people. And after the talk, um, 
the head of Colorado State University Business School got up spontaneously and said, we're going to give Kane a full scholarship if he wants to come to the school here. And then Kane leans into me and he's like, well, what about the money you raised for my scholarship? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you get to keep that, start a business, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, he's like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> this kid's a hustler. He's a hustler. It's a, a scholarship for the school of life. Yeah. I mean, Kane is such an entrepreneur. When, we, when, when he had these thousands of people come for, for his arcade, and, and people came every weekend, every time it was open, but there was literally a four-hour line. So he made a fast fun pass. For $25, you could skip the line. And parents were so stoked because, I mean, they had kids that wanted to skip Disneyland to come to play Kane's Arcade, so they were like, a $2 fun pass is such a savings for us. So they were stoked. And then Kane also started um, I don't know, a family fun pass where you could get six fun passes for $11.99. So it was like a grand savings of a penny if you bought in bulk. So, he's a creative genius. Um, and then after our talk in Colorado, not only did he get this full offer for Colorado State University, this other guy stood up and he has one of these private space companies. So he offered Kane a trip to outer space. What? Say what? Yeah. And I got a free backpack. <laughs> well, that was very nice of them. Yeah, it's a nice backpack. Uh, yeah. If his parents let him go, he has to get a permission form. Has he made any progress on the bike shop yet? The bike shop is uh, still in kind of fantasy mode. Uh, he's been going to swap meets and fixing up his own bikes, but he's also just started middle school. He's um, 11 now. And, uh, yeah. Megan Dean, are you back here? So Megan over there uh, spoke at Comp 3? 2, 3. And um, she's going to do an update later, but I would like to introduce you two to pass her along to Kane because she builds bikes. She builds frames. Oh, cool. Yes. Awesome. So, um, and I, I would like to invite you all to take part in the Global Cardboard Challenge. There's uh, three websites, canesarcade.com, cardboardchallenge.com, and then our foundation, we just got imagination.org, uh, which is, yes, awesome. Can't believe that was... And your imagination on Twitter? And at imagination on Twitter. And mm. our goal is to engage one million kids in creative play this year through the Cardboard Challenge. So share the story, do something at home, get involved. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. And I, you're the first people I can share this with, but I just got back from New York, and I'm, while I was there, I met with the folks at Reddit, and they're going to partner with us. They're going to make their global day of service on the same day as our global day of play moving forward and really get behind this idea of having these global flash mobs for kids all over the world. Awesome. You heard it here first. Heard folks. it here first. <laughs>